How long can it take us to get to Merida? Oh, from the map, I'd say four or five hours. Boy, my vacation sure is turning out a lot different than I planned. Oh? What I mean is bad, but I came down for another voyage on Mimi, and now I'm looking for a lost city. <laughs> Do you guys ever put oil in this thing? <laughs> Honey, this thing drinks oil. Well, it's thirsty again. What's that? It's a homemade hieroglyph. I've been working on it with my mom. This part is the way the Maya represented canoes. These rectangles represent water. And this line with the two half circles means wood. So, wood boat traveling by water. Mimi? Right. And this is the head of the god of the number two. When you put it together with this part, it means second. Second Mimi? Mimi two. OK, vamonos. Is turning into a real detective story. So far, we have two halves of a Maya monument, a lost king, looters, and a pot that could tell us even more. The trouble is, we don't know if the pot was made by the Maya 14 centuries ago, 14 days ago. So here we are, heading for Merida, the capital of Yucatan, to visit the government archaeology offices. Maybe someone there can help us solve the mystery. This was one of the Spanish haciendas. See the conquistadors standing on the heads of dead Maya? We're gonna get to work on this right away. Me too. Yeah. I'll just wander around a little bit. Pepper? Sure, I'll tag along. So we could meet at Jean's and George's place at um, 4 o'clock? Americano, eh? That's right. Perhaps you are interested in some relics <laughs> from the past. No, thanks. No? How much money is it worth? 
Well, of course, it's illegal to sell it, but... Fifteen, twenty thousand? Dollars? Keep scraping. Don't worry. But if you break it, you've bought it. <laughs> now, how does this thermoluminescence thing tell us how old the pot is? Well, clay is made up of a lot of different kinds of material. Some of that material is radioactive. It is? Yes, but tiny, tiny amounts. Not enough to hurt you. Other material in the clay stores energy when it gets hit by radiation. Okay. Now, energy is released whenever the clay is heated to a very high temperature. I see. So, wait a minute. Let me guess. We're going to heat the clay in this thing and then release the energy. Mm -hmm. How does that tell us how old the pot is? Well, when the pot was made, it was put into a kiln to harden the clay. Heat it up. Yeah. And all the stored energy it had then got released. So when the pot was brand new, it had zero stored energy. But the radioactive material was still there. And so the clay began storing energy all over again. So any energy it has now has been stored since it was made. The more energy, the older it is. Right. It's not really precise, but it can clearly distinguish between new and old. Hey, CT, look. Pure jade. If you drop the pot, you can pay with that. <laughs> What do you think? Interesting. Oh, excuse me, eh? This looks like the real stuff. Sure it does. I'll keep an eye out for you. We are closing, madam. Please, we are closing. Y no vuelves a abrir ahora. Excuse me, sir. Look at this. Do you like it? Where did you say these are from? Well, that I cannot tell you. But they are for sure real. Pedro. Yeah. What's going on here? Well. Miss Thornton, Captain. Are you in the habit of shopping in back rooms? We were interested in some Maya relics. Oh, I see. Well, I'm afraid my assistant was trying to fill his pockets at your expense. These are worthless copies, brought to us by some Indian villagers, also trying to enrich themselves. Fakes. Of course. Anyway, as I'm sure you're both aware, it is illegal to deal in pre-Columbian antiquities. Okay, now we put our clay sample in the heating chamber here, and we're ready. Here goes. Well, 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 will you look at that? <laughs> what are we looking at? See, this is temperature. The further along the scale you go, the higher the temperature, the hotter it is. As the clay got hotter, it gave off a lot of luminescence, light energy. That shows that there was a lot of stored energy in the clay. It is a lot of light. And if this is the kind of clay I think it is, it suggests this pot's been around a long time. 
fantastic. What would it look like if it was new? You know, fake. Well, remember when I said that the clay in a new pot loses all its stored energy when it's put in a kiln? Mm -hmm. We just fired our sample and released all its stored energy. So if we heat it up again, the graph should look a lot like it would if the pot were new. See, here it is, heating up, getting hotter. Still no luminescence, see? Nothing. It goes up at the end here because the clay is beginning to glow red hot, but it doesn't have anything to do with stored energy from radioactivity. I'd say we've got the real thing here. Well, we have to do a few more tests to be certain, but... Now, let me run this through the old brain cells again. We have a Stella from Cobalt, one half of which you found underwater at Tulum. Probably dropped there by looters. Possibly. Thank heavens for skeptics. They keep us honest. So far, this Stella tells us finally what happened to Chuck Ballon. He was captured. And taken to sight you. So it would seem. What about the pot? Also apparently looted. Also found in Tulum. Also <laughs> dedicated to Chuck Ballon. But is it also from Koba? You know, somehow it just doesn't look like pottery from Koba. I know what you mean. Hey, this might help. The 12 pepper dotis here is a date. Three kawak. 12K. See? This part was really afraid at 12K. I just filled the line in. Good work, Kiche. Isn't three kawak 12K? Two years after the captured date on the Stella? Two years. That's what this next glyph means. We couldn't figure it out either. Two tun. Two Maya calendar years. And then the glyph for captured. OK, think about it. This pot celebrates Chuck Balam's capture two years after it happened. But they wouldn't be celebrating that in Koba. That means the pot must be from the lost city. Exactly. It's like you. Terry? It makes some sense. <laughs> I think we should spend some more time at Ina tomorrow, checking out the clay that's in this pot. That could tell us where it's from. We can check the satellite photo of the Koba area. Any help from that electronic friend of yours? Maybe. Look at this. Location, somewhere south of Koba. See, this database shows all the places where the site you glyph has been found. There it is. Right. And if we check the next listing, we'll find that the location is the same. It seems the site you glyph is almost always found in south of Koba. George can help. Lord knows he's walked around there enough. <laughs> Maybe you should ask Harvey Westerman. Oh, it's the captain. And you must be Pepper. I'm pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. You guys, guess what? My pot's real. Only I guess <laughs> it's not my pot anymore. Anyhow, we think it's from the lost city. No kidding. Wow. What's this about that snake Harvey Westerman? He has a curio shop downtown. A buddy of his tried to sell us these. When Westerman came in, the deal was off real quick. Tried to tell us this stuff was fake. Well, it is difficult to tell from photographs. Isn't this the, uh, what do you call it, emblem glyph? Hey, it's the site you glyph. It sure is. So he's already from the lost city. Oh, no. Well, if he hasn't gotten much more than this, he hasn't done much harm yet. Yes, but he'll really go at it now. He knows we know something. He'll take as much as he can as fast as he can. We don't have enough hard evidence for the police to get involved. Westerman will hide this stuff now. Notify Ina. Yeah. We better find that lost city in a hurry. Like your attitude, Captain. This is getting good, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Affleck. Archaeologists, like the ones in the second voyage of the Mimi, are a lot like detectives. 
but their clues are hundreds, even thousands of years old. And they can never really be sure if they've solved their mysteries. You know, never really know what was happening back in the past. Well, there's a man here, 60 miles southwest of London, England, who's doing some archaeology that might help provide some new clues for some old mysteries. This rolling countryside in southern England was once farmed by people known as the Celts. That was 2,000 years ago, during what archaeologists call the Iron Age, even before the great Maya civilization. Things are different now, but in among the houses and highways is what looks like an Iron Age Celtic farm. For over 10 years, archaeologist Dr. Peter Reynolds has been trying to learn about Iron Age farming by actually doing it. This is the Butzer Experimental Farm. You're, you're pretty familiar with the ordinary kind of archaeology, where, uh -huh. where we dig things up, mm -hmm. you know, pots, um, bits of bone, post holes, pits, gullies, banks, ditches, all that sort of stuff. Now, that's ordinary archaeology. Uh -huh. And then the archaeologist who's dug all this stuff up, he, he makes up what it means. Now, my job actually starts there, so it's a different kind of archaeology, because my job really is to test all this stuff. So you don't actually go to the sites, but you take the information and kind of you try to figure we, it out? We take the information off the archaeologists and say, okay, well, now, if you think it means this, let's test if what mm. your thoughts are are right. It's, it's not so much a farm as a huge laboratory, <laughs> and that's the best way to think about it. Each individual bit is like a single experiment. You put them all together, and in your head, anyway, you could think of it as a farm. Uh -huh. But in reality, it's, it's a big open-air laboratory. Peter hopes his laboratory can help settle a question about Iron Age farmers. Roman historians described the Celts when they came here at the end of the Iron Age. They said the Celts were good farmers, providing wheat and other grains for all of Europe. But later archaeologists don't agree. Most of them have thought the Celts were kind of stupid and barely able to raise enough food for themselves. Peter tries to figure out how good the Celts might have been as farmers by using Iron Age methods to farm. He trains cows to pull Iron Age types of plows. He builds houses and fences using the materials they used. He studies the fossil evidence and raises animals similar to those that the Celtic farmers raised. Careful records of all the activities of the farm are kept so that Peter can know what was at least possible for the Celtic farmer. Peter uses archaeological evidence, scientific knowledge, and common sense to build the structures at the Butzer farm. The evidence for this large roundhouse came from circles of post holes found all over England. Those archaeological discoveries gave him the size of the house, and Roman historians said the houses were covered with straw thatch. Did they have fires in there? like the Oh, yeah, it's a full domestic house. You can live inside it with an open hearth. You've got a cooking oven inside. But if you have a fire, and there's no hole in the roof. If you have a fire on the top... Well, if you had a to... hole in the, in the roof with a cone-shaped building, all you've built is a very dangerous structure altogether. It's a bit like a, a, an, a, an elementary blast furnace. This is where logic and scientific knowledge come in. There would be such an updraft from the fire through the hole that sparks would be drawn up into the thatch, creating a fire hazard. But. If you build a fire in the middle there, the smoke from it just percolates out through the straw. It just filters through, no problem at all. The smoke would rise to a layer above the heads of the people inside and slowly filter out through the thatch. Peter has tested this and it works. There's another advantage. All sorts of things live in straw, and by smoking it from the fire all the time, you actually kill all the nasty little bugs that go bumping uh, straw, not to mention keeping mice and rats out of it. There's another major reason why you can't have a hole in the roof, because in this country, as you're well aware, it <laughs> rains, right? Yeah. The fire's in the middle, the hole in the middle, it'll put the fire out. And the other thing that's more important than, the, than just the rain and the fire is rot. Because we're building it out of wood and straw, if you have a hole at the top, it's going to rot slowly from the top downwards. Peter's in the process of putting a new layer of thatch on this building, and he showed me how he does it. How do you know? That, I mean, is this what they, they used in as Iron Age times? How far, do you know? Well, as far as we can tell, you see, thatching is now a tradition that goes back 7,000 years. And we've got lots and lots of houses in England which are still thatched. Really? Yeah, they use different systems today. I'm using the oldest known system of thatching, uh -huh. which is called sewing. This comes the hard part, because what I've got to do is draw that real tight. Okay, now then. 
we beat that bit mm -hmm. and we tuck that down again because if we don't we're going to get a little river between the mm. two and then that'll go down into the straw and cause it to leak. This really doesn't leak? No, it certainly doesn't leak. I tell you what, I've got a bucket of water and we'll do a little demonstration of how the water droplets come down the straw. <laughs> Look what's happening. It's running down tops of the straws. Put some more on. That it just keeps on going down, down, down. So if it just slips off one straw, it's picked up by one underneath. If this was pitched at, at a different angle, then the straw, would, the water would go under the straw? It would just go straight down through. And if you were standing inside, you'd get wet. <laughs> but in this case, no problems. You see, it's all coming off the bottom. What we could have done is to put the bucket, another bucket down below there, and we could tip the whole lot down, and you'd find you get 99.9% of the water in the other bucket. Really? Yep. Try dumping a whole bunch on you. OK. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Let's just have a look at the straws underneath. And there you are. They're all dry. They're not even wet. Yep, you got it. Wow. Peter thinks that the Iron Age farmers must have been very efficient and that they tried not to waste anything. The straw for the thatch comes from what is left after the wheat is harvested. If you're going to grow wheat, you want the seed to make bread. And this is a byproduct. So the Iron Age people didn't have to go to someone else to buy their roof. That's right. You actually grew it in your own fields. <laughs> Peter even grows the same kind of wheat that Iron Age farmers grew. The whole reason of the farm is to find out what kind of crop yields they had. So what we've gathered together are the real cereals that belonged to 2,000 years ago. You mean the real plants? The real plants, because they've been grown consistently ever since. Well, how they... do you know they were grown 2,000 years ago? Ah, now that's where we come back to the archaeology. Remember, the archaeological data is the key to everything. Yeah. When we excavate sites, we find seeds that have been turned into carbon. Fires, bonfires, accidents. And these little tiny seeds we can actually identify down to different species of plant. And using those species, we've been growing them over the years, asking that fundamental question, how good were Iron Age farmers? The farm tools that Peter uses are reproductions of tools that archaeologists have found. Sometimes Peter changes the archaeologist's theories about these tools by actually trying them out. This sickle isn't much different from ones used today, and it works great. Look at this. A nice bunch of straw. straw. Most archaeologists have assumed this was also a sickle for cutting straw. Try this sickle and see how you go. Just hack it away at the bottom there. Now then, what have we got here? You see a basic problem. You're actually uprooting the cereals. Mm. That's no good for thatching. So I've come to the conclusion that our work shows that that really isn't a sickle. What it's something that? else. Well, I think there's something else I can show you just now. I've got a bit of wood. And one of the things they use a lot of, you hang on to that for a second. Okay. One of the things they continually are using are wood for making into fences and hurdles and gates. You see, and if you get that sickle there, it's nice and comfortable at that angle. And you can start just simply, and you can begin, and you can split. You see how lovely that tool is? Of course, there's no way to know whether Peter's theory about this tool is correct either. But at least he knows that it works as a wood splitter, and it doesn't work very well as a sickle. Growing Iron Age wheat with Iron Age methods has led Peter to believe that the Roman historians were probably right after all. Iron Age farmers were a lot better than archaeologists have thought. The results are, are mind-blowing in the sense that we've created a system whereby we get two tons to the acre, three tons, four tons, depending on the season, depending on the climate. That's a better harvest than a lot of farmers get today, even with the use of chemical fertilizers. Because all the archaeologists thought that in prehistory, farmers struggled to survive. It was what they called a subsistence society. They just made enough to keep living from uh -huh. year to year to year. This result shows that you could produce a surplus it looks like the Celts must have grown much more wheat than they could possibly have eaten. If they had a surplus of wheat, then they must have had a way to store it. Peter thinks he knows how they did that, too. We find these things all over the Celtic world. 
and you can store grain down a pit like this with enormous ease because all you do is fill it up with grain you put a clay plug on the top uh -huh. you cover that over and at the end of the day what actually happens inside the pit is the grain begins to grow just where you put the clay seal on produces mm -hmm. carbon dioxide that gas goes down into the pit and stops any more grain growing hmm. And then the temperature takes its temperature from the mass of the rock, so it's low temperature. You've got all the ideal conditions for grain storage. Have you tested it? Oh, I've tested this for the last 20 years, and it worked perfectly every time. <laughs> it's one of the things, you see, that we could use in modern agriculture, something from 2,000 years ago. And in fact, in some countries in the world, they are doing just this. In Australia and Argentina, they store thousands and thousands of tons in underground holes. Wow. The pits are anywhere from 3 to 20 feet deep. What do people think these were for before you try that? Well, once upon a time, the archaeologists, what, 40, 50 years ago, thought they were underground houses, and the prehistoric man was a troglodyte. <laughs> well, brutes who lived in holes is not how Peter would describe Iron Age people. In fact, from his experiments, he thinks they were clever and productive farmers. OK, coming around the house, you can see the... My last lesson at this laboratory farm made me feel a little like an Iron Age farmer myself. It was another example of how the Celtic farmers made use of everything they could. Oh, it's called daub. Daub? It, daub. D-A-U-B. Oh, daub. Now, this stuff is designed to give the wall fabric strength. What's it made of? How's it made? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Not only am I going to tell you the ingredients, I'm even going to show you how it's made. Well, we learn about this from the archaeological evidence. When we find fragments of daub, we analyze it down. And at the end of the day, we're recreating the recipe here that we found from prehistoric sites. <laughs> what you've got inside there is a lot of clay. You've got a lot of fiber, a lot of soil. Mm -hmm. Mix all that up together. And the last thing you've got inside there is dung. Dung? Dung. From him? Well, from her, partly, her. from the cattle, from the horse. It's all gathered together because that actually acts like a glue. I guess there's nothing like actually doing it to get an understanding of what Iron Age life might have been like. Peter's convinced me that the Celts were better farmers than people used to think. But I wonder if kids back then liked daubing the walls any better than I did. 